WH Smith Book Show across peaceful, prayerful, small town America. There strides a giant of horror. Welcome to the spirit of Stephen King. Words on a page, words on a line, words unspoken, read between the lines, just words. first check-in from that station, Bangor, Maine, WZON, they owned, they owned the Gerheim Games. John, Middle America is quiet and conservative, a moral majority behind staid facades, picket fence, and rambling rows. Much of Middle America is also exquisitely pretty. The state of Maine has the Atlantic Ocean, forests, and these lovely cupboard houses. This is the American dream come true, peace and prosperity in small towns. But according to Stephen King, beneath it lurks the American nightmare. In any one of these houses, overnight, a domestic pet may suddenly turn into a satanic monster. Or from beneath the clay floor of the cellar, a ghostly hand from the past may rise and like a talon, claw its way into the heart of the terrified family. Coming for you, Rachel. Immortal. Uh, sooner or later, the boogeyman will get us. He always does. Um, we come to an end, and a lot of times the endings are not particularly pleasant. And there are a lot of surprises along the, uh, along the trail. What I am interested in, and what I, what I believe, is that uh, ordinary life as we live it is reverberant with strangeness and eccentricity and uh, unexplained meetings and behaviors that uh, all speak to me very clearly of, uh, of levels, either other worlds or levels of this world, that we can only intuit. When a child grows up in a small community like you did, a child sees life at very close quarters, did you see anything in childhood that later influenced your writing? Well, you know, basically you're asking me a lot of uh, Freudian bullshit. You're, you're asking me to tell you what screwed me up so badly as a child, what, what put a warp in my record that, uh, that caused me to be the way I am. And uh, whether you grow up in the country as I did or whether you grow up in the city as Jim Herbert did, you see plenty of life with the skin still on it and the nerves still on fire. Um, it's a question of what you do with that and how you recycle it. And I have, a, I have an idea that that's not Freudian, that's Jungian. It's built into the machine. And there are certain circuits that fire up. And uh, if they do, you're stuck with that in terms of your writing. There are things that happen that life becomes, you know, Life is the meat that you turn into meatloaf as a writer. Where did you grow up? I grew up in a little town called Durham, which is about 140 miles south of here. What was your childhood like? What was Durham like? It's a small town. It a, I used to joke and say that there were more people in the graveyards than there were upright. Uh, and that's pretty accurate. There were about 900 people when I grew up. I went to a one-room school. There were eight grades. In, in one room. There were three people in my class. I like to tell people I was at the, at the head of my class, but there were only three of us and one of them was foolish, so there weren't that many. And uh, it was mostly dirt roads in those days, and w we had running water, but it dried up in the summertime because we had a shallow well, and then we had to lug it from the pump at the parsonage. It was a very British upbringing, really. Were you writing as a child? Well, I wrote uh, a little bit of everything. I think that when you're a kid, you're a little bit like milk in the refrigerator. You take the flavor of whatever is next to you in there. So that uh, if I was reading Westerns, I wrote Westerns. And if I was reading science fiction, I wrote science fiction. And if I was reading horror, I, I wrote horror. And uh, I, uh, 
read more horror than anything else, and so I, I wrote more. Were you scared as a child? Yeah, I would say that I was scared a fair amount. I had a big imagination, so I could imagine all sorts of things that would happen from rational fears, like losing my mother, who was my only parent. My father deserted uh, us, deserted her and my brother and I when I was two and my brother was four. So as a kid growing up in a single parent family, you worry about that, you're afraid of that. But I was afraid of the dark because I, was, I wasn't afraid of the generic dark, I was afraid of what might be in the dark, you know. And uh, I could visualize all sorts of things. And like most people with big imaginations, when things are going well and the lights work, everything's under control. But uh, the uh, horses would have a tendency to slip their bridles a little bit when the lights were out and, and uh, I was by myself. And I'd worry about what was under the bed or what might be hiding in the old church I had to pass to get back from my, my friend's house. Uh, so I would say that... Uh, I suffered with my imagination a fair amount of the time, but of course in the end it, uh, it's taken care of me in my old age, so to speak. At 47, Stephen King isn't quite ready for the pension yet, nor does he need one. He's the world's richest author, earning more than one million pounds each month. He writes every day of the year except for Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year and his birthday. More than 75 million of his books are in print and he's so prolific that he writes still more horror stories under the pseudonym of Richard Bachman. There was no one moment when I realized that fear was worth writing about, but there were a series of accreting moments uh, where I started to realize that one of the great themes of American life, as I understood it, was the irrational outbreak of violence and uh, how strange the people were that did it. I've told the story before, but there was a mass killer in Nebraska in the 50s, Charles Starkweather, who went on a killing spree with his girlfriend, Carol Ann Fugate. Uh, and he's a figure, it seems to me he's a seminal figure in modern American life, post-war American life anyway. He's the first serial killer. Uh, people asked him, Charlie, why did you do it? And he kind of went, felt like it, you know? Which is an amazing existential statement. Saw it, would have loved it. Felt like it. Ever since then, when I write about monsters and when I write about uh, supernatural creatures, vampires, werewolves, whatever, I'm trying to remind myself that these things are only analogs for all the things in our lives that are totally inexplicable and they're not very nice. When I was smaller, I used to get into my mum's bed after dad had put on his uniform and gone off to work in Portland. I used to sleep beside her for an hour before breakfast. Dark, fear, firelight, shadows like praying mantises. I didn't want to be put in these woods 70 miles from the nearest town with these drunk men. I wanted my mother. It's the world that I know. When I was a kid, first taking writing courses in high school, one of the things that I heard was, write what you know. We were told this over and over again. And I thought to myself, I never had the nerve to say this out loud. I wasn't as mouthy then as I am now. My idea was, if you lived in a little house in the country on a dirt road and had the lug water in the summertime, and go to the bathroom in an outhouse because there was no water, you wouldn't want to write about what you knew because this is boring. This is just dumb. So I'd write science fiction or I'd write westerns or whatever because what I was doing, the basic function of my writing as a teenager was to escape from a life that I regarded as boring and stultifying. Later, when I got to college, little by little I started to get a perspective on that, that life and I started to ask questions about the life that I lived then and was living now. And I began to see the way that I could combine fantasy to illuminate a life that I'd considered boring. And the minute that I did that, it turned into Wonderland for me. How did you get started as a writer? 
I sold a story called The Glass Floor, which was a kind of Poe-esque tale, uh, to a magazine called Startling Mystery Stories, one of the last of the pulps. That was in uh, 1969. I was 22, and it was uh, $35. Had you always wanted to be a writer? Well, I had the ambitions that kids have, that you want to grow up and become a Texas Ranger and fight Indians in, in uh, the West, and then you discover, well, we're not really fighting the Indians anymore. That's just at the movies. Or you want to be a, a fireman or a policeman. Those were all passing fancies. I seem to remember that I wanted to be an astronomer for a while and study the stars. But you find out what you're good at. And uh, if you're real lucky, and I was, what you're good at is something that you'll love to do as well. This is Bangor, Maine, a town with its own king. He lives in a mansion, he owns the local radio station, he funds the Little League baseball, and these people, they're like his subjects. They adore him, they protect him. You would find that he's very much a regular guy. Um, you wouldn't know that he is a multimillionaire and the best-selling author in, in the world right now, or among them. He's just, he's the type of guy you'll see walking down the street, reading a book, um, I've seen him walking down the street reading a book in the rain, just, you know, unassuming. Bangor, Maine thinks Stephen King is a really terrific person. He does a lot for the city, he does a lot for the people in it, and he's just a great neighbor. When you know where the roads go, a place is home. And I know where all the roads go. The people here uh, are so used to me that I'm basically a neighbor and not a famous person. So Bangor's home, and anybody's got to you know, make a lot of their home place, that's all. What frightens you? I'm frightened, I think, by the thought of something happening to one of my kids. That's number one. Um, cancer, car accident, uh, any of the ills that flesh is heir to. Um, I think that I'm afraid of, I hate going to the doctor, I'm always afraid that the doctor's going to see a spot on my lung or he's going to he's going to take me into the office and sit me down and say that I, I have some very bad news and I can see all these things because I've trained my imagination over a long period of time to know exactly how these horrible scenes go. Um, I'm afraid of the irrational things less than I used to be when I was a kid but I'm still afraid when the lights are off and I'm on my own I get very nervous and start to worry about, don't laugh, the thing that might be under the bed. Slow sleepers usually took an additional hour or two to get down there, and on many nights they did not get all the way down at all. They awoke unrefreshed, sometimes with unfocused memories of unpleasant tangled dreams, more often with the mistaken impression that they'd been awake all night. I can remember one time driving home on a windy autumn night. Uh, it was a full moon, and I looked up into the rearview mirror, and I was certain that I saw somebody sitting in the back of the car looking at me. It was just the shadows, but uh, it scared the hell out of me. Is the car a source of horror? Well, <laughs> in American life, in, in, in Western civilization, the car is always an object of horror. It's an object of love, it's an object of hate, it's an object of humor, it's an object of horror, but it's there. It's like a, a foreground figure in our lives. The, I wrote a book called Christine, which started out to be oh, almost like a joke, and very quickly it ceased to become a joke, and the car that the kid finds became an all-consuming monster, which was to a large extent, my experience.
What's the principal button that you're pressing? I think that probably the thing that people respond to the most is the idea of people behaving decently in the face of awful events, incomprehensible events. As time has gone by, I've become more and more convinced that sometimes bad things happen to good people simply because they can. They do. You wrote a novel that absolutely defines that. It's called Pet Cemetery. Yeah. How did you get that idea? Well, Pet Cemetery was a novel where everything was true up to the point where people and animals actually started to come back from the dead. My wife and I and our kids, who were three kids by then, uh, moved to a little town about 12, 14 miles from here called Orrington because I got a writer in residency at the University of Maine. And my youngest son, Owen, was at an age where he had just learned to sort of trot. And one day, he ran for the road. We lived right beside a very busy highway, and I could see this huge fertilizer truck coming, but he didn't know it was coming. And I caught him and grabbed him by one leg and pulled him down on the edge of the road, and the truck thundered by, and it blew his hair back. That's how close it was. I'll never forget that, the fine baby hair. I just was wringing sweat from every pore in my body because I could imagine uh, what would have happened if I'd missed him, if he'd actually run out into the road. And we knew because there was a pet cemetery behind that house, and it was filled, stocked, if you will, with animals that had been killed in that road. There were cats, there were dogs, there were guinea pigs, there was a pet raccoon, you know, and all those markers were up there. And uh, in the next two or three days after that happened, I, I couldn't sleep. I kept obsessively remembering him and the wind blowing the hair back. So some time went by, and uh, I put the Pet Cemetery together with what had almost happened to my son and started to write this book, which didn't start out to be a supernatural novel at all. But little by little, it got worse and worse. And what I remember is working on Pet Cemetery mostly nights. I don't know why. I'd, oh, I know, because I was teaching school. That's why I worked nights. So I, was, I, was, I couldn't work in the house because it was too cold in the writing area, it froze up the electric typewriter. I had an IBM Selectric II, and it would skip all these places. So there was a general store across the road, the road where all the pets got killed and where my son had almost been run over by a fertilizer truck. And the guy who, who, who owned the store rented me his front room for $25 uh, a week. And I wrote the book, and what I remember is the smell of peanut butter, because all the boxes were stacked there, you know. And uh, I wrote that book, and it got worse and worse and nastier and nastier. And I thought, this is just not publishable. This is, this is like one step removed from pornography. It would be pornography if it was about sex instead of death. But the other thing that kept coming to my mind was that in America, at least, death is pornography. We dress up our corpses like dolls and put them on display. They're like dead Barbies. So... I thought, well, I'll put all this in the book, and there was a tremendous sense of freedom about writing it because I never expected to publish it. You're such a prolific writer that there were people who feared you might flood the market, so you decided you would write under another name, the name of Richard Bachman. And the publishers weren't really afraid that I'd flood the market. I don't think that they thought that those books, which were good, were quite what they wanted. They weren't brand-name horror novels. They weren't exactly what they wanted. And I said, could we do them as paperback originals if, if I did them under a different name? And they said, yeah. And so I got the first one, which was called The Long Walk, ready. And they said, what name shall we put on it? And there was a Bachman-Turner Overdrive record on the stereo. So I said, Richard Bachman. What are your extravagances? Well, I like old books, particularly old, you know, first editions that are signed. I've got a couple of... Uh, William Faulkner's, and I've got a signed Theodore Dreiser, and I like uh, 
a lot of the pulp magazines, the horror magazines from the from the 30s and the 40s, those things are great. Beyond that, there isn't a whole lot. I've got two or three fairly expensive guitars, but only one that I bought. Apropos guitars, I've heard you've got a rock and roll band. Well, it's not mine. Um, it's actually Kathy Goldmarks. Kathy is a uh, literary escort in San Francisco. Her job is to get writers from the airport to the bookstore, to the studio, or wherever they're, you know, uh, puffing their, their books. Anyway, Kathy had the idea that maybe she could put together a band of writers uh, to play a concert at the American Booksellers Association convention in Anaheim. This was like three years ago now. And she got in touch with a whole bunch of people and heard that I played, which I do, and asked me, would I play guitar? And I said, well, I can't play rhythm, but I could play some, I mean, I couldn't play lead, but I could play some rhythm guitar. The band kind of gelled, and we, we played a tour uh, last year in May. We played, I think, eight or nine cities down the East Coast, and actually progressed to the point where people would pay to see us. Now, not a lot, maybe, but we weren't too bad. It's like what Samuel Johnson says about woman preachers and, and dancing dogs. He said, you, you don't pay to see it done well. You just pay to see it done at all. <laughs> No, no, I wouldn't say we're a challenge to the Rolling Stones, but uh, the Rolling Stones would, would know what we were about in the sense that we play a lot of three-chord blues and just basically kick out the jams and try to have a good time. We've spoken to lots of people in Bangor, and they say about you that you're a nice, ordinary guy who has not been changed by wealth or fame. Is the decision not to be changed, is it a conscious decision of yours? No, I think I've been changed, and it certainly wasn't a conscious decision on on my part, uh, not to change. Uh, people do what they're built to do. I'm convinced of that. I think that we have free will, but that it's a pretty small area. Uh, I don't have, I grew up not even middle class. I grew up poor in, in Maine. And uh, really, the only thing that I ever knew to want was to, in terms of material possessions, to have a car that wouldn't break down. We're back at cars again now, you see. I wanted that. As a man, I wanted to be married and to raise children and find out what it was to be a father because my own father kind of ran out. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to repeat that. What do you think is the sum of what you've done? Hmm. Well, I think that I've given a lot of people a, a certain amount of twisted pleasure. And uh, I think that I've taken a lot of people away from their daily lives and taken them on uh, uh, ghost train rides. I think you say ghost train rather than fun house in, in England. And, and I built a lot of ghost trains and, and people have gone on them and maybe enjoyed themselves. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything beyond that. I don't hold out any big brief for literature as a, uh, uh, an ennobling uh, thing, although I do think that literature, that stories save lives, that they s literally save lives and, and make life possible, um, that they open up our lives and make them richer and better. But that's a lot more humble than the idea that uh, somehow literature is important. If you ask me, is what I've done important? The answer is, to me, yes. To other people, maybe. Words on a page, words on a line, words unspoken.